Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship service at the First United Methodist Church Mule Shoe. I'm Chuck Smith, your liturgist for the month of uh, July. Uh, like I say, we'd like to welcome everyone that, uh, here in the sanctuary and also uh, uh, a welcome to our uh, audience on uh, Channel 6 later. Uh, we would like you to register your attendance uh, on the pad uh, provided there in the uh, in the pews. I believe our announcements is uh, for this week. Uh, do believe they will resume the ladies' Bible study tomorrow. Is, is that correct? That's about all. Uh, about the only announcement we have. Uh, does anyone have any announcement they would like to make? Okay. Well, welcome to everybody. Then stand and join us as we sing about the wonderful words that give us life. join me in an attitude of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together today as a community to worship you. We ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit come and be with us here today. That you worship, that we worship you, Lord, with open hearts and open minds. That you speak to us in our day-to-day -day life. That you encourage us, Lord. And we lift up to you, Lord, the joys and concerns of our hearts. For you know what we need, and you know the joys in our life. But Lord, we especially lift up the need for more rain. We ask, Lord, that you bring the water and heal the land. And we enjoy such great life, Lord, and blessings that you give us. <clears throat> and we ask, Lord, that you continue into our life. That you make us the, the people of your kingdom and guide us in your ways. And this morning together, 
as a family here in Muleshoe, in Texas, in this nation, and around the world, in various languages, Lord, we join in our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Just a reminder that there is a place for your tithe and offering at the back of the room. It's the summer slump, and I'm sure Chuck would really appreciate. Oh. How's everybody doing today? Pretty good. Okay, so I have a question. A minute ago, we sang a, a song about wonderful words of life. Where do you suppose we find those words? In God. In God and in our hearts, well, where else do we kind of see them where we can just look at them and there they are? Jesus. Well, where do we find what Jesus said? Where? In which book? Do, the Bible. Bingo. <laughs> That's it exactly. The Bible gives us Jesus' words. And you know, at one time, he was asked, what's one of the lines in that song is, give me faith and duty. Duty is what you're supposed to do, right? Well, one time somebody asked Jesus, well, really? I mean, because Jesus said a bunch, right? And that book is pretty big, right? And he was kind of like, well, I want the short version, this dude was. And he said, well, so Jesus, what is it that I'm really, really, really supposed to do? What's the most important thing for me? Trust in God. Nope, it's not what he said. Prayer. Nope, not what he said. Bible. Read the Bible every day. Nope, not what he said. <laughs> wow, well, what could it possibly, you know what he said? Well, there you go, but no, that's not it. There are two things. He said we needed to do. The first one is to love God. <laughs> love God, right? With everything we have. It says with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls, all that's in us. And you know what the other one was that's just the kicker that we can never do? It says to love our neighbors as ourselves. You remember that now, huh? <laughs> well, here's my question. Does it say, love the neighbor that looks like me? No. Does it say, love the neighbor that thinks the same way I do? No. Does it say, love the neighbor who likes the same Skittles I like? No, no it doesn't. It just <laughs> says your neighbor. So is your neighbor only the person that's sitting next to you? Yes. Just that person right there? That's the only neighbor? Everybody. No. Yeah, it, if you extend it, it means everyone, right? We're supposed to love everybody, even... Uh-oh, wait a minute. Do we have to love people we don't like? Yes. No. Yeah, we do. <laughs> no, can't do that. That's the hard one. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's horrible. I hated that. Yeah, don't worry about that. Although I have somebody who had a crush on me and we're married now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the point. Okay, so this is what I want you to remember today. Nobody wants, God doesn't ask us to like only the people like us. God asks us to love everybody. Yeah, those are kind of cool, aren't they? Do you like them? They're sparkly, aren't they? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Everybody find one. Okay. 
Okay, now show it. Uh -uh. Only one, that's two. Only one. Now show it to your neighbor. Are they the same? No, none of them are the same because none of us people are the same. So we got to just work real hard to love everybody, okay? All right, let's say a prayer and y'all say, y'all repeat after me, okay? Dear Jesus, sometimes you ask for us to do really hard things. Give us courage. To love all our neighbors and to love God the best. Amen. Okay, y'all can have some candy. You can take your jewel with you. Well, it looks like there's a lot in there. You could probably have two. Okay, while they're making very difficult decisions up here. Is there anything for the celebration box? Uh oh, I see somebody. Yes. We had a family reunion this last weekend, had a good crowd, and I think we had a lot of fun. And I'm just grateful for family. Awesome. I second that. We were part of that reunion. Um, David and I celebrated an anniversary this week. We've got Marshall Wayne and his family with us, and we've had their two older kids this week. What a blessing they've been. And later, Marshall Wayne celebrates a birthday. So July's a busy one. And the rain. <laughs> I would like to celebrate the blessing of the rain. Thank God. Whoop, whoop. And I would like to celebrate my sister's life, Beatrice Darland Rosiska, 85 years. B lived from the time she was 28 or 30 with five or six kinds of arthritis, including rheumatoid arthritis. Her fingers and toes were all twisted. She never complained or said she hurt. How awesome. She raised four fine boys. She was just a blessing, and I know I'll miss her greatly. Oh, you will. Praise God for B. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm almost forgot the most people thing. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Okay, stand and join us as we sing.
Good morning. It is uh, great to be here again. This is my second Sunday, um, and it is very good to see uh, such bright and shining and smiling faces. I've uh, felt very welcome here uh, last Sunday, um, and it's just good to be here. And I am just blessed uh, to be in Mule Shoe this morning. I was very blessed to be in Spade uh, this morning as well. It was very good uh, service in Spade, and um, I hope and pray that God will open my mouth here uh, this morning and speak the words into your lives that need to be spoken. Um, But if you would join me uh, just for a brief moment of prayer. Lord, I ask you, uh, Holy Spirit, to come uh, and dwell within my heart in this moment and and guide my words so that they are your words. Let us hear what you would would like us to hear this morning. Speak to us, Lord, and guide us and renew us into life for this week and every day. We pray this in your most precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from uh, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 11, uh, verses 32 to 44. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see, how he loved him, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said these for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. So today I'm going to be. Probably not as often as it should be. But I'm going to talk about the importance of sorrow. Uh, That's the sermon title today, The Importance of Sorrow. Is it well? Well, I think it is. The definition of sorrow, in a basic definition of sorrow, is a feeling of deep distress caused by by loss, disappointment, or other misfortune suffered by oneself or others. Now, I'm not talking about evil. That's another, that's another topic. That's another, another thing entirely. But what I am talking about is sorrow. It's, it's the fact that we live in a world that is broken. It is important for us to allow ourselves to deal with sorrow and feel sorrow when it's appropriate. We are not called to avoid it. We're not called to avoid sorrow, but we are promised as sons and daughters of God the fullness of resurrection. 
which is also not something that happens in the future, in the distant future. No, it is something that happens to us now. We are resurrected people. It's not fully here yet. Maybe we can, we can dive deeper into that again sometime in the future. But your resurrection starts the moment that you accept Jesus Christ into your life. The moment that you are baptized by water and the Spirit. But we are lost in a world that does not know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To be born again is not to be taken from the pain and sorrow of this world, but to be born into a hope that is more than this world can ever offer, born into a love that this world cannot give us, born again by a water, excuse me, born again by water and the Spirit into a faith that this world does not understand. As I mentioned last week, my, my mom passed away uh, just this past January. And I'm very acutely aware of sorrow right now in my life and, and have been for a while. I'm not sorrowful that my mom passed because I know where she's at. I know who she's with because... As I've mentioned, my mom is probably the primary reason why I am standing here today, not just because she birthed me, but because she encouraged me into ministry. She loved me into ministry. She always knew that I was going to do something along these lines. I mean, when I was a child, I used to uh, preach to my stuffed animals so that's, that's an indication that, that, that I was probably going to do something further in, uh, when I became an adult. But my sorrow was not in the passing of my mom. My sorrow was in the suffering that I witnessed my mom go through. She had uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Very bad. Now, uh, over 10 years ago, my mom had ovarian cancer. And she survived that somewhat. But going through something like that in chemotherapy and, and massive surgery that she had to go through, she was never quite the same physically. But she was a person of, of, of great faith. And she endured. But over a year ago, the rheumatoid arthritis just got really, really bad. And she just hurt all the time, and there was no relief. And eventually, about, you know, six months before she passed away, I think it was about six months before she passed away, that she got to where she couldn't even walk. She couldn't even stand on her own. And there were times when I would uh, be here in Lubbock, you know, talking to my mom, and I, I talked to my mom twice a week. You know, I still, you know, I talk to, to my mom and dad um, twice a week. Uh, when I moved down here to Lubbock, when I was out in Kentucky in seminary, when I was, you know, any, any time, you know, my mom and dad are, are a very important part of my life. And I talk to them. They're, they're some of my best friends. But I would talk to my mom on the phone, and she would, she would be screaming out in pain. And there wasn't much I could do about it except pray for her. And my prayers at the beginning of last year were, Lord, would you heal my mom? I didn't see that healing. So I began to pray for God to give my mom relief. If you cannot heal my mom, Lord, then, then would you bring her home? But I can tell you, even in that prayer, and even in my faith, and my relationship with God, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I was angry at God. I was in a deep, 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 well, how many deeps can I do? I can do a lot of deeps. Uh, very deep sorrow. 
Unfortunately, God has very, very broad shoulders. And when we question God, when we doubt God, God is there and says, ah, okay. Bring it on. I can take it. You don't understand, but hey. In verse 35 of our scripture reading today, Jesus wept. And this is like the shortest verse in all of scripture. Jesus wept. He wept. Now there's a lot of uh, debate among scholars as to, to what's actually going on here. That in, in tradition at that time, it was very common for uh, people to, to show uh, how much you cared about the person who had just passed away, that you would weep at their grave. That you would wail, that you would show so much sadness. But oftentimes in, in the Gospel of John and in, in the other three Gospels as well, the, the authors always take pains in showing and emphasizing the fact that Jesus wasn't quite culturally responsive. He did things according to the love of the Father. Not what was required of him by culture, but what was required of him by God. And personally, I believe that this is Jesus weeping for two reasons. Not because it was expected of him, but because he was genuinely saddened by the fact that his friend, Lazarus, was dead. But he was also weeping because of Martha and Mary. And their unbelief. Their response to Jesus when he showed up finally was, Why didn't you get here sooner? Why weren't you here? Because you could have saved Lazarus, our brother. And Jesus' response to that is, did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of the Father? In verse 38, Jesus is deeply disturbed. In the Greek there is kind of more along the lines of Anger doesn't quite fit it. It's a little too, uh, too strong. But he definitely wasn't just, well, you know, a little upset. He was upset that everybody was disbelieving. Isn't this the guy who gave sight to the blind man? Isn't this the man who did all these miracles? Why? If he was here before Lazarus died, he could have saved Lazarus. And this miracle is more than, than about uh, a lot of things we can talk about. But the main thing that this miracle is about is the fact that death is not the end. Death is not the end. Sorrow is not the end. But these are things that we have to go through, that we have to endure. If the Son of God wept, then what is to say that you won't weep? I would like to uh, read a little quote from a book, not, not this book. I couldn't find the book that I actually wanted to quote out of. It's probably on Oklahoma City, by the way. But fortunately, I remembered that this quote is actually in this book, so I could do it word for word like I was supposed to. Um, but I want you to hear this, and, and this, is, this comes from a book um, uh, authored by a guy named Gerald uh, Setzer. And the title of the book is A Grace disguised. 
and I believe it was written in 94 or 95. And this is a book about this man's journey that he lost his wife, his mother, and his daughter all in the same day in one tragic car accident. And he went on a very deep journey of sorrow and suffering, trying to understand why so much loss. And he came to this conclusion that, you know, that, that uh, the quickest way to reach the sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N, okay? The quickest way to reach the sun and the light of day is not to run west, chasing after it, but to head east into the darkness until you finally reach the sunrise. Not to allow ourselves to be afraid of the dark, but to walk through the dark when it shows up. Because we don't walk through the dark alone. And that is the great privilege of being children of God, is that we do not walk through sorrow and pain alone. If Christ lived his life the way he did, which is he laughed, he probably told really bad jokes. But he felt and he loved. And that's what it means to love, is to feel. To love is to feel happiness, but also to feel loss. At the end of the movie, uh, The Hobbit, the, th the third movie, which is not, it's, it's a movie loosely based on J.R.R. Tolkien's book, by the way. I'm, I'm kind of a, a nerd in that respect. But it, towards the end of the, the third movie, there, there's this love story that develops between this, this elf character and this dwarf character. And, and at the end of the third movie, this dwarf character is, is killed. He's, he dies in battle. And the, and the, and the elf character is, is weeping and, and wailing and crying out. And the king of the elves is, is there and, and she asks him, why does it hurt so much? Why does it hurt so much? In the Elven King's response is because it was real. Now the, the, the resurrection of Lazarus is kind of a mirror image in some fashion of the resurrection of Jesus, which is not that far off from the resurrection of Lazarus. But there are some differences. For one, the resurrection of Lazarus is a physical thing. It's a bodily resurrection. But the resurrection of Jesus, which is the resurrection that we are looking forward to, the full resurrection, which is the full restoration of all of creation back into the fullness of God's house. It is a, it is a bodily, but it is a spiritual resurrection. It is a full resurrection. And Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. Jesus is in the tomb for three days. And yet, Mary and Martha and the disciples, they saw what Jesus did with Lazarus. But on Good Friday, they weren't looking forward to Easter. They were in sorrow. This life is painful. This life includes great joys, but also sadness. 
Do not shirk away from the sadness. Do not pull away from the sorrow. Because God has called us to be emotionally, spiritually, and mentally mature. Now, from, from the time of my mother's death to uh, probably about a month ago, I've been in the wilderness. A wilderness journey with God. Through a very strong wilderness of sorrow and pain and, and all that. But, but God has always been there. And God has comforted me. Because I turned to God. And that is why sorrow is important. Because it teaches us. It teaches us about God's love. It teaches us that this is not what God wants for us. But God does not turn away from us. And odd to me that, that one of the greatest things about being in relationship with God is that sometimes the closest we get to God, when we get closest to God is when we hurt the most. When we're crumpled on the ground. Not just kneeling, but I mean in the fetal position, crying uncontrollably is when the Father says, I love you. Sorrow is important. Not as important as love and joy, maybe. But sorrow is important. Soon we're going to sing a hymn. It is well with my soul. This was one of my mom's favorite hymns. And there's a story behind this hymn. Some of you may know it. Some of you may not. But this is not a hymn written out of joy. This is a hymn written out of deep sorrow. The gentleman who wrote the words, Horatio Spafford, wrote these words in 1873. And he was on board a ship off the coast of England when he wrote these words. He wrote these words in response to the tragedy that I believe it was a week earlier or over a week earlier, another ship in the same location that these words were written in. A different ship, of course, you know. A ship sank. And that ship had his wife and daughters on board. Now, his wife survived, but his daughters did not. And his response... Now, he was in Chicago at the time. He had had to stay in Chicago to finish up some business dealings that he had. He was a lawyer. All the stuff was going on. He had to take care of He had sent his family ahead for this vacation. They were going to England to, to hear an evangelist and, and spend time in, in a family vacation. So he, he was home when this happened. He received a telegram from his wife. They're gone. And the, for the rest of his life, Horatio Spafford, I, I'm, I, he had a weight on him. Waiting to see his daughters again. But he had hope. I don't know if, if something like this happened to me. I don't know that once the ship I was on got to the very location and the captain came to me and said, this is where your daughters died. I don't think my response would be to run back to my cabin and pin a hymn. 
But my response would be, it is well with my soul. In all things and at all times, it is well with my soul. So when we sing this hymn of response, reflect upon sorrow. Reflect upon joy. And know that Jesus wept, but Jesus has also justified you. And though pain and suffering last for a fortnight, the kingdom of God is forever. Amen and amen. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing, It Is Well With My Soul.
benediction. No matter where we find ourselves today, Lord, and every day, whether in joy or sorrow, guide us, comfort us, speak into us, Lord, your compassion, your love, and guide us into the people that you need us to be. For this world and for your kingdom, let us be the children of God and witness to the world the power of Christ the power of the Holy Spirit and go forth there in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and be the people of God Amen